you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So we are close to the end of the conference. So I hope that I will bring your attention during the next 50 minutes. Um, what I will talk today is about uh, the value of the information that you can extract for your different security device that everybody of you operates on your on your networks. Um, I will try to prove you that uh, it's very important to reuse this information and to try to inject it in all the device to, to be more reactive when you have a security incident, for example. So first, classic introduction. So who am I? My name is Xavier Mertens. Um, I'm active on Twitter using the Belgium Blowfish. So I, I always use the same uh, avatar, so it's very easy to find me back on the internet. Um, I'm doing just like uh, most, most people here, a lot of consultancy during my day job, and I'm security blogger during the night. And just also for information, I'm a co-organizer of the Brucon Security Conference in Belgium. Um, I'm presenting today uh, a personal research, so it means that my employee has nothing to do with the, the presentation, so that's the classical slide. Uh, I feel free to read it, but it's quite common. Um, we will first uh, talk about some facts. So, what is the current situation on the on on your networks today? And, um, then I will present you a toolbox, and I will finish with different example. Just one remark: uh, my tool is almost uh, something. Uh, it, it's not. It's a technical talk. I will present technical example, but I will not provide you a toolbox ready to be used. Why? because everybody uses different kinds of firewalls, different kinds of devices. So for me, it's almost impossible to develop something ready for um, everybody in this room. So it will remain uh, very theoretical, but my, my, my goal is ready when you will go outside this room at the end of the presentation, you will have maybe some nice ideas and you will learn how to implement basic but very funny stuff and interesting. Um, defense. VS attack. So I consider myself as an offensive, a, de an, an, a defensive guy. Offensive security is very important. Yes, we break things, we can root a server, we can break into an, an, an appliance, and it's always funny to, to see how it works and to, 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 to get the control of a device. But defensive, defensive security is also very funny for me because it's also very important to be proud, to not be out. Yes, somebody tries to attack me. I was able to detect the guy, to take the right countermeasure in time. So I was not pawned. It's OK. That's the, the, best, the best way of working for me. That's my day-to-day -day job. And finally, you have also to know your enemy. So it means that by learning the techniques that all the bad guys use, you will be able to better defend yourself. So I, I'm really working on the, on the defensive side. Um, I'm working for, m for I'm well living in Belgium, working in Belgium, and in fact, Belgium is often well known for a lot of different nice, nice stuff. Belgian waffles, of course, Belgian beers, Belgian mussels, very nice secret conference like here in Switzerland. But also, Belgium has a very complicated uh, political situation. Everybody I walk to a conference, a lot of people ask me, oh, by the way, does Belgium has uh, a government now? Yes, we have for almost one hour, or one, one year, no, <laughs> sorry, one year. That's, you, un you understand why? So one year, and the situation is almost back to a normal situation, but we still have different, like in Switzerland, different uh, language in Belgium. You have French speaking guy, Dutch speaking guy, and also some kind of German speaking guy in, um, in green. But it means what, what, what's funny also over Belgium that the Belgian motto is in French, l'union fait la force. Yes, that's strange, which we can translate in English by unity makes strength. And for me, that this motto was a very good opportunity to develop this, uh, this talk, those slides, because we can apply the same motto to information security. So I've, when I found this small picture, I Immediately, I say this is the perfect representation, the perfect resume of my talk, because we have plenty of small fishes. We can attack the big um, black shark. So really, we can take all the device that you use every day. We can put them together and try to fix the situation, to fix the security issue. So what are the situation in most of your network today? 
you have something like this, I'm pretty sure. So you have plenty of different devices, which can be open source, which can, which can be commercial solution. You have malware analysis system, proxies, IDS, firewalls. And all these devices work quite perfectly today. So I'm, I will not talk about vendors, but almost we can be sure that if you buy a firewall, it will work, it will do the job quite perfectly. And all those devices, they take actions on the network. So the firewall, you see some, a packet coming from an no IP address, it will drop the packet. An IDS which may, will maybe send a TCP reset, TCP reset client, reset server. The proxy will deny access to a spe specific URL for um, a browser. And the malware analysis will also take nice action if it detects some suspicious connectivity with the control centers and so on. But what's very annoying for me, you have the different red lines. So it means that all those components are working in some kind of silos. So what does it mean? You have maybe in your organization multiple teams. You have a team which manage the firewalls, other guys manage the IDS. You have also different tools. You have a console for your IDS, a console for your proxy. You need to, to maybe have different procedures. So it's very, very difficult to manage and increase the load of everybody. That was the situation a few years ago. Today, we can say that we have a new, brand new toy for a few years, which is called SIEM, Security Information and Event Management. That's really um, a big toy which is able to collect all the logs because all the different components generate logs. So when a firewall drops a connection, it will write an event, an IDS will do the same, a proxy. But once again, we have the same problem. Logs have different formats. They are stored in different databases, in flat files. They are sent using different kind of protocols, SNMP, syslog, I don't know. So the next step was to generate a big database with all your logs which are collected, normalized, so that's the goal of a SIEM. And this solution will help you to search and to generate nice report. You will search, for example, for um, a suspicious IP address, and you will see that this IP address has generated events in first the firewall, the IDS, maybe in the proxy, uh, a connection was refused on a Unix server, on the LDAP server, plenty of stuff. So it's very easy to browse the logs and to extract some interesting information. But we have weaknesses. So that's a resume of the previous slide. First, we have independent solutions. So remember the red lines, red dotted lines. So we, it's impossible to make those devices at the moment to talk to each other. We have also static configurations. If we need to change something in a firewall, you need to fill a change request. You need to, it must be approved by a manager or a team leader, which will pass to the guy having hands on the keyboard to perform the changes. It's a very huge process. Locks are centralized, only the locks. So it means that the real data and the, 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 the action that we could take are, are not centralized at the moment. There is no global protection. The firewall will do the job on his path because it will protect the DMZ, it will protect a, a specific site, and um, real protection is, re is not easy because when somebody detects an attack in a SIM, which is based on, on the, the most SIM configuration, if you detect an attack first, it's always good because a lot of SIM implementation are not working properly, and if you detect an attack, it's already too late because you need to build to ring the guy which is the owner of the firewall, please change this, block this, and so, so it's fully, it's unmanageable. But we have, I have good news for you, we have a lot of data which are very valuable in your, your, in your devices. Some kind of data are IP addresses, usernames, URLs, domain names, you can also have some digests, MD5, SHA-1, so plenty of information, and this information is already stored somewhere in all those devices. So the goal is really to process them with a more efficient, in a more efficient way. We can also have data coming from multiple sources, online repositories, so internet has full of interesting websites where you can download useful information. We will see later, for example, a list, a public list of malicious domain names used by botnets and so on. You have also internal resources, of course, in your different components, 
and also automatic process because you can already generate events based on correlation in your theme. So you know that this IP address is malicious because we saw the IP address in this event, this event, and this event. So that's the good news. We already have the raw material to implement this. Uh, the first goal, of course, is we need to use the data. And of course, to use this data, we will go back to the, to the roots of IT. Every, everybody knows in IT that the, we have process. So we have input data, a process read them, process them, and gener we generate output data. It's exactly the same in this way. But the most important, you need to have good input data, otherwise you will never have good results on the, on the, on the other side. So it's very, very important to be able to collect properly the information on the left to generate right uh, output. What I will explain today, there is nothing brand new. So since years, um, everybody was trying to exchange data between applications. I was a big fan of the Commodore Amiga uh, computer. And when I, when, when I used the Amiga, there was already a language called Rx. So implemented in uh, 87, so it's quite a few years ago. This language was able to make application talk to each other using specific some kind of a pipe. So an application w which had uh, a Rex interface was able to send data to another one or to receive some comments to behavior in a specific way. You can ask, for example, uh, on uh, a painting program. I will give you an example. Uh, an example: A painting program should be able to draw a line. You say in Rx, draw a line from coordinates 1010 to 2020, for example. And the program will draw the line. So you will be able to script and to add more power, more automation to your application. That's exactly the same today. Nothing changed. If you need to implement this kind of, uh, of solution, so the toolbox and to extract more value, there are some very important steps to, to keep in mind. First, security is a big market. So all the devices that you will buy, that you use uh, every day, they cost a lot, a lot of money. So it means that if you invested a lot of, uh, a, a huge amount of money in those devices, the goal is to use them as much as possible and I like to use the, the idea of the Microsoft Office effect, use as much as possible all the features. Everybody in this room is using Microsoft uh, Office, Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, but are you sure that you use all the features present in the application? I'm using Word to write my reports, I make some tables, some bullet points, some, I insert some pictures, but there are plenty of very interesting features that even I don't know, or I, and I don't use. So, Investment in time to learn doc the documentation to see what's behind, is there some backdoor, is there some interface that we can reuse, is very important. That's why you need to invest this, so this time and maybe go back to your vendors, to your provider and say, okay, I know that I have this application, this software, this appliance, could you give me more information? What's the database format? Where I located my data? Um, is it possible to extract this kind of information? Uh, usually, the vendors, they will buy, they will sell you, sorry, uh, the solution and they will, they will always try to keep the business for them. So they will never communicate a lot of information, but they have console to perform some debugging, they have some command line tools, they have some hidden features that can be very useful to implement what we will see um, soon. And finally, be a hacker. So it means that you have to learn how it works and make it work like you want. After all, you buy the device, it's, it's your device, so you are free to do whatever you want with it. Of course, you have licenses, you have end user license agreement, and vendors will always try to block you, saying, yeah, you can do this, you can't do this, or maybe you have to work like this, but you have to implement, play, the, uh, try to, to investigate as much as possible. And to do this, we have different ways to, uh, to access all the data on the different systems. We have backdoors. When I say backdoors, it's the, the right term. So it's not a backdoor speaking about malware and so on. But we have different ways to access the data. Command line interface. Most devices are manageable via web interface today. But you have for sure a command line interface. 
So why not try to automate some process via the command line to see if there is no hidden command, there is no more power, more scriptable or automatic feature that we can reuse. Most devices also provide web API using JSON, XML request, so you can connect to the device, you can fetch some interesting data, you can maybe create objects into the, <coughs> the system. Databases, the device are working with database because they have to store the data, so database is present in the system. So why not try to access them directly to reuse the, 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 the real value of, your, of the information stored in it. Scripting languages. There are plenty of languages for free that you can reuse to automate things. Uh, I will show you an example of Expect. It's quite very powerful. You can simulate SSH session, Telnet session. You can do everything you want. So automating all the stuff. And why not from time to time, serial console. All device also have old, quite whole console. And you can maybe try to automate using some uh, terminal available on Unix to try to send commands and extract uh, data. How to extract the data via different kind of protocols. So we have the tools, but we can also use HTTPS, TFTP, SSH, SNMP, uh, IFMAP. IFMAP is a specific protocol which uh, I think has, is mainly used by uh, Infoblox devices where you can learn what type of device are connected on your network. Uh, for example, when a device connects on, uh, on your LAN, you can send IFMAP messages and you will, see, you will say this device has this IP address, it's the, the device is owned by Peter and this uh, Peter is a member of the accounting team, for example. On base of on this information, you can apply some kind of policy on the port and say Peter from accounting has only access on those device of those website and so on. Or you have also a lot of proprietary tools like DB Edit in Checkpoint. Checkpoint, nice firewall, but I hate the GUI because it's a flat client. It works only on Windows systems, but you have plenty of nice to of tools like DB Edit available via the command line, and you can inject objects, create, delete, add rules via command line, and you can script all the stuff. So automation is the key. Uh, first. For sure, I am, and I'm pretty sure that you are too. We are lazy people. So if we can automate stuff, if we can start a script for the, uh, to do all the job, why not? One of our, my best tool to automate uh, stuff is Expect. This Expect is a standalone tool, common line tool, but we have plenty of modules for Perl, Python, and all the common languages. And you simulate a session. So basically, it's all li li like the, the, the quite old script for BBS. You send a string, you expect an answer, and based on the answer, you can take decisions and automate all the stuff. So this is a real a simple example. So I starting, I'm starting. i creating a new, um, a new session. I start a SSH session using my user on this host. I'm expecting something. If I don't have a timeout, but I'm receiving password, I will just send my password, and so on, and so on, and so on. So I will just simulate a user behavior and you can write very, very big script. You can, for example, I script to take backups of Cisco switches, you have backup to, to uh, very old devices, it works over Telnet. Uh, you can also simulate uh, HTTP session, so it's quite powerful. So based on all those information, uh, I can propose you a new architecture for the, your, 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 your security devices. So we keep the same behavior, so all the devices, the device or application generate new actions, and based on those actions, they generate logs, nothing brand new, and we still have the theme which handle all the logs. But based on the theme, so the theme may, via correction rules, may detect suspicious activity and send information into a toolbox, and this toolbox will inject data into the different components. Or for more performances, we can bypass the theme and Action and a specific action will be automatically to use a toolbox and inject data into other devices. That's the architecture that I would like to see more and more to really increase the reactivity. The goal is really to say, okay, I have an event, maybe I will generate uh, an alert, the alert will be, pro will be seen and will be uh, handled by a security analyst, but at the same time, I will take an action and block already the IP address. The toolbox that we can uh, that we can use. So once again, I will just give you some examples and some ways to 
make more uh, proactivity between the devices. But once again, I, I don't have some codes to share. I don't have a, a tools ready to download today, tonight. And uh, it's just some big ideas. First one, using HTTPS, we can access this. This example comes from uh, a Palo Alto firewall, if, if I'm right. So you can interact with the firewall using HTTPS. The first step will be to generate an API key. So you send an HTTP request. It can be very useful via wget. You receive your key, and then you have a very, very big API uh, available when you can create or change the configuration as you want. This is a nice example. This is a nice, a very short example when you can create simply a new host in the, the database. So you send your query. It's a config. You have your key. Action set. You define, in fact, the whole, the whole configuration is based on the XML file, so you define the path in the XML. You create your name on, the, on which firewall you will hack, in which VCs, and you create a new host. That's the name. The IP address will be 192.168.0.1. You can put a description. You send this HTTP request, and you have a new object created in the, data, in the database. The next step can be creating a rules, creating a commit, and you are done. You can send create this object. The new host will be the attacker. You will send the next rule will be drop any traffic from or this IP address. You commit, and in a few seconds, your firewall will be able to block all the traffic instantly. Another example is uh, Snort. So Snort is a well-known uh, IDS. But there are a lot of other security tools which accept snort rules. So why not generate on the fly specific rules and to send them via another protocol, via SSH, copy the file, FTP, also a, an HTTP put. But you simply create the, the rule. This, this example is based on Perl code because you have plenty of modules, so you can use the snort rule module. You create a new one. It's an alert, TCP for any protocol from this IP address, and you, put, you can also put nice information, and most important is the, sort, the snort rule ID. And based on this, you put this new rule in all your different security devices, and they will be able to detect suspicious activity coming from 10.0.0.1. 10 An example of device uh, accepting uh, snort rules is a FireEye malware analysis system. So you just inject your own rules, and you can instantly block or detect more malicious activity. IFMAP. So this is uh, uh, the, the protocol I described a few minutes ago. Uh, it's an open standard, mainly used on the InfoBlock systems. And um, using IFMAP, you can publish nice information, uh, or you can search for information in uh, some kind of also database. You can search for IP addresses, login, location, a domain. So location can be uh, interesting. You will be able to locate which device is connected on which switch port, for example. And uh, based on this, you can also use Perl, and you can generate nice requests. So we, s we start a knife map sessions, and we say, OK, we have uh, an IP address. This IP address, it's this MAC address. This MAC address and this IP address, the, the device belongs to John and John belongs in the group employee. And based on this, we can, again, generate rules, alerts, and take actions if we see a specific activity coming from John. SNMP. SNMP is well known as a monitoring protocol, but we can also push configuration to make change in devices. Uh, in the example below, the SNMP, so in, in, instead of a classic SNMP get, we can issue an SNMP set. And this command means that we will send an SNMP uh, uh, set to this IP address using this SNMP community. This is the OID belonging to, the, to belonging to the device with a specific IP and a file. In fact, this is an example for a Cisco device where when we will push a new ACL via TFTP on this router. So in one line, if we, have, if we generate automatically an ACL on a TFTP server, we send an SNMP set to this router. It will, via TFTP, load the ACL, apply it, and we can, once again, block 
a device, block an IP address, and so on. One line of one one command line. Again, for the Cisco devices, TCL, uh, modern Cisco devices use a framework called EEM, which means Embedded Event Manager. So it, it does exactly what I'm trying to uh, describe today, but only for Cisco. So you can define specific events in the Cisco configuration, and those events will be able to trigger a TCL script. Again, TCL script, you can upload them in the flash memory of the device. You can use it via TFTP. And this example say that if in my syslog pattern I detect an up-down so uh, uh, a flapping interface for fast Ethernet 0 slash 1, for example, change state 2, so it's a classic radio expression, I just, my event will be CLI command execute this script. That, that is a, a TCL script. In this case, it's a notification, but you can also event what you want and generate nice uh, actions to block a user to do very nice configuration. Uh, TCL is very powerful, so it means that the TCL script running on a Cisco device will be able to communicate with external devices. Uh, for example, there are, n it's, there are one or two malware known to be running on Cisco device using TCL. So you can communicate, you can start TCP session, you can generate traffic from a Cisco device to the outside world. Those examples, you need at a specific moment, you need, a spe um, you need a tool to correlate all the stuff and to be able to, to take actions. Uh, in, my, in, in this case, I'm using OSSEC. Uh, I'm really a fan of this, this tool, which is a log management solution, so open source. But it has very, very uh, two, two important uh, features. First, it's called the active response script and the alert engine. The active response script is very easy to understand. In case of specific alert, you can trigger a script. It's a script, so you start everything you want, and you can, again, take actions. A basic script uh, delivered with the standard configuration of OSSEC is, for example, uh, to, block an IP, to block an IP address or username if you detect a brute force on a server. If I see an access denied on SSH, SSH access denied on server A, then server B, then server C in 30 seconds or one minute, you block the IP address. So OSSEC is, is very configurable, and based on this, we can receive all the events generated by, by the, the devices and trigger all the script to, in fact, perform action reaction. That's the goal of the system. Every time you see something suspicious, reaction will be do something, block, drop, send an alert, and so on. And is, this is an example of OSSEC rules. This is the rule number one, uh, 100101, level 5. If I see five times in 60 seconds an access denied, so this is the, the type of alert invalid group, what I do, add block user for location local, this is my rule, active response. So if I see five times the same access denied or access denied on multiple servers, I can extract from the alert the username and I can block the user. It's real principle of action reaction, like well known in this uh, in this game. Some examples now. So real example. A second disclaimer. Uh, I already give some names about uh, vendors. I spoke about uh, Infoblox, Palo Alto, Checkpoint. I have to give names because most of them are already used in your infrastructure. But I don't. I hate working with vendors. So uh, I have no affinity with them, and the word are just given, the name are just given for uh, as example. First, you can use online resources. A well-known uh, list of suspicious domain names is uh, malwaredomains.com, where you can, via a Chrome tab, you can download at regular interval, you can download a big file. This, that's, this is a plain text file of malicious domains. It's updated, I think, daily of every two or three days. And you can also implement Google Safe Browsing. Again, with a little, a few lines of Perl, you can see if this domain, http evil.com, if it's malicious or not according to Google. It works quite well. And uh, so if from your proxy, 
you extract useful URLs, you can pass them to Safe Browsing via to, to the Google Safe Browsing API, or you can match your domains.txt file. So you can store in the database the domains and you can process in real time the, the different domains. So it adds a new layer. So you exchange really the configuration between the, the solution. The maybe the the, the the example that that works pretty well because we in same my company so uh, I also made the same kind of presentation for customer and we made a, a, a live demo. Uh, it's based on different components. So you have the Fireheim malware analysis box, which is a product which inspects your HTTP or SMTP traffic in real time and which try to detect interesting stuff based on malware. So do you see? Control a uh, com command control center. Do you see some malicious domain? And this this tool is able to generate alerts when it detects something suspicious. We ho we have plenty of different firewall models, checkpoint, Palo Alto, IP tables. Insert whatever you want here, and OSSEC. And the integration of all the product. We have the FireEye FireEye system analyzing live all the traffic. It detects uh, a malware. It generates an event to OSSEC, sending the information. OSSEC extracts the IP address of the command center, and we inject in live in the checkpoint, the Palo Alto and IP tables, the IP address. The goal of this, of course, FireEye is a very expensive device. So maybe you, will have, you have a lot of money in your organizations, but often you have only one appliance that you deploy where you have the most part of your traffic. So the, co the, the core offices or a very the, the the main internet access point using this solution you will be able to push the bad ip addresses to all your remote sites so if you have offices in brussels paris zurich new york london you can scan the traffic at one point and you can inject and say oh by the way this ip address was really malicious so we block it immediately in a few seconds in all the firewall um, in the organization Dynamic user blacklist, it's the same, but for users. So we have a syslog concentrator, we use OSSEC. We can also use SSL VPN to, 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 to detect bad, bad user behavior. And we assume that the user are stored in a LDAP directory or slash an active directory. And the goal is almost the same. We receive information via the SSH daemon from multiple servers. We say, oh, access denied for user John, user uh, Andre, and so on. It's processed by OSSEC, and OSSEC, based on script, can also block and change, change the user in the Active Directory. So it means that the user is kicked off immediately. Bad for the user, but you have time to investigate, and you know that at least the, the user is temporarily blocked and will not be able to do more, even malicious activities. Another example, SNTP. Uh, malware analysis. Um, it's another project I'm working on um, based on Postfix, the well-known MTA, Cuckoo, which is uh, an open source malware analysis system, and Cuckoo, Cuckoo MX, which is my, my per script. In fact, how it works, uh, all the SMTP feeds received by Postfix, Postfix trigger a script, which uh, via Cuckoo MX uh, so it sends all the data to KukuMX. KukuMX extracts all the MIME times, so all the interesting PDF files, URLs, .exe files, .zip files. Send them to Kuku for real-time analysis. So using this system, I, for all emails coming on my domains, automatically, if there are suspicious, well, suspicious, specific types of files, I will scan them, and once again, I, can, I will be able to take actions if something suspicious is detected. MySQL self-defense. Um, I had to do slides yesterday evening because uh, they, that's, that's something brand new and uh, it was also mentioned by Alexander during his presentation. Um, the way is, in this case, to make MySQL, a MySQL server to talk to a firewall or something else to block offensive users. By default, MySQL has no way to, uh, to lock the, the, uh, the, the warning or the errors based on malicious SQL statements. So if you make a typo in your URL query, normally it will be sent back to the client and the application must 
take the action and must notify the user, must, must do something about the, the error, but MySQL will not log it. You can enable the full logging on MySQL, so it means that it will log on the flat file all the queries, but if you have a very big MySQL server, you will kill it, so simply, because it will require a lot of I.O., CPU, so it's not doable on a production environment. So my idea was to use MySQL proxy. It's MySQL proxy, the goal of this tool is to do load balancing across multiple MySQL servers. It's easy, that's fun, but in my case, what's even more fun, MySQL proxy can use a uh, Lua script like Nmap, and you can inspect SQL queries, and you can rewrite them on the fly before sending them to the real server. And finally, MySQL uh, another nice feature called UDF, it's user-defined function, when based on dynamic libraries, you can add more features to MySQL. And one of, one of the UDF that I use is this one, which simply allows you to store something in a log file. So you do select error log, blah, blah, blah. The blah, blah, blah string will be locked on the error log of the MySQL. So if we put all the different things together, we have this kind of infrastructure. We have a client sending information to the MySQL proxy. The MySQL proxy change the on the fly the query, so it adds a show warning and a few uh, environment variables, sent to MySQL daemon, and in case of errors, the error is stored in the error log. And this error log, you are free to do whatever you want, to, to parse it, to analyze it again with OSSEC. OSSEC will send extract the IP address, the IP address will be pushed to the firewall, and once again, we do the job. Very important slide about the controls. Um, when you implement this kind of solution, so you try to automate as much as possible your infrastructure, first think about security. Because we are trying to improve the security by doing this, but we can also introduce more security issue. That's why strong controls must be implemented. Why? Because if we allow automatic system to change dynamically the configuration, we can be in trouble from time to time. That's why first you need to implement a very good authentication and authorization. The, the example that I gave about the um, web API for Palo Alto, of course, you need to put access list in the firewall to allow only the server running the script to allow the firewall to define a strong login password and all this kind of stuff. Of course, you need to lock all the changes. So based on the events, you change your configuration, but your change must generate new events which will be used to generate a report every day. So, for example, every day when you come at 8 in the morning at the office, you will receive a report which say, this has been changed tonight because we, we detected this suspicious IP address, we blocked this user, blah, blah. So you need to keep the control. Uh, very important slide because I, I, I told to uh, managers uh, previously this week, I presented the same slide but more oriented to, to uh, risk compliance and so on. This kind of tools can break the compliance. For example, PCI DSS, we, you need to have a strong control of who, do what, when and why. If you let system change your configuration dynamically, maybe it will break some golden rules uh, asked by the PCI DSS compliance. Use an out-of-band network. If you are under a denied of services attack or if you try to change dynamically the configuration of, of, of a device, if your network is already overloaded by queries, maybe you will be unable to access your device. So use out-of-band networks. And finally, you also introduce risk of deny of services. You, you, you will deny your service yourself. For example, if you detect that your root user account is, is rejected several times and you block automatically the root account or the, administrative, the administrator account, or if you block your DNS server, for example, you will be in big trouble. So don't kill yourself. So conclusions. Um, for me, when you buy a security product, it's very important to not, to not buy a box. I hate box. They, you have red box, you have yellow ones, blue ones, I don't care, you buy a solution. So read the fucking manual, try to extract as much as information possible from your devices, contact the vendors, attend trainings, uh, read forums, read documentation, because once again, you buy the product and you must be able to use it at the full power of the product. 
And finally, it's up to you. So I just gave some IDs, I just gave some pistes, but I will never write a toolkit ready out of the box for everybody. So investigate, maybe I will give you some IDs, uh, I hope so, but investigate, take some time and uh, try to, 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 to make your device working together and in a more efficient way. I have a few minutes for questions, I think. So, any questions? Thank <laughs> you.